There was Y.A. Tittle, the passer, and Whitey Ford, the pitcher. There was a middle linebacker named Sam, a slugger named Mickey, and of course, an immortal named Babe. But in the mid-60s, the Yankees and Giants were dynasties in decline. Yankee Stadium needed a new hero. The man who filled that role was a quiet receiver from Texas Southern. He wore number 45, and like those stadium stars of old, he was a big play performer. In fact, his name seemed to be the stuff of legend. His name was Homer Jones. He was slim-waisted, he had heavy, strong legs, very strong legs, had big hands, and he could run that hundred in anything you wanted it. I mean, anything that the guys today run it in. As a collegiate track star, Homer Jones had once beaten 1964 Olympic sprint champion Bob Hayes. But despite enormous physical talent, Homer's small college training hindered his development in the NFL. When the intricacies of the pro offense mystified him, he was often known to diagram his route right on the spot, a ploy that confused defenders more than his own teammates. We had a St. Louis cross called in the huddle, and that, that was a wide out, Homer's split end position, was supposed to run about 10 yards down the field and cross over the middle of the field and catch the ball. Homer ran a fly straight down the field. Quarterback picked it up, hit him for about a 75-yard touchdown. After the game on Tuesday during the films, Allie Sherman lit into him. Homer, it was supposed to be a St. Louis cross. Now, Donna, you got to know those plays. Homer, that was a St. Louis cross. And Homer said, well, coach, how was it for distance? The freewheeling Jones not only improvised pass patterns, he also changed forever the etiquette that goes with scoring a touchdown. Elmo Wright certainly invented end zone choreography, and White Shoes Johnson scored high marks in artistic impression. But such behavior was non-existent in the NFL until Homer Jones came along in the mid-1960s to haphazardly create what is known as the Spike. Well, I had always said that uh, when I made my first touchdown, I was going to throw the ball in the stands. And uh, in the meantime, I had forgotten that uh, they changed the rules on the off season. That I think it was a $500 fine for throwing the ball in the stands. And as I crossed the goal line, my intentions and my ambitions was always to throw that ball in the stand. But I thought about that $500, and it came down, I threw it on the ground. <laughs> so that was the original spike right there, the origin of it. <laughs> In a true reflection of the times, Homer became a New York City cult hero. While back home in tiny Pittsburgh, Texas, he emerged as the town's number one celebrity. Jones, these are the ones that kind of slightly pushed me up into football. In fact, when the high school days, uh, I only had one on my side, and that was him. She was against the football plan <laughs> because she had bought me a saxophone. <laughs> he came out to the barn and asked me, he said, I want to play football. Mom want me to play in the band like a sissy. <laughs> she said, I want to play football. She said, can I play football? I said, you think you can play football? He said, yeah. Despite never having played on a winning team, Homer Jones was one of the greatest deep receiving threats in his time. Three times he surpassed a thousand yards in receiving in a season. And he still holds the NFL's highest career average gain with 22.2 yards per catch. Football historians might have looked more kindly on him had a reoccurring knee problem not limited him to just six full-time seasons. In the years that followed, if he'd been with a, with a really good team, he would have been uh, one of the great receivers of all time. Homer Jones.